Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, my name is Rohit Sachdev. I'm the Managing Director of Soho Hospitality based out of Bangkok. I'll cut through the introductions as that was already made. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is to give you some information on uh, macroeconomic data um, within the region, which would be a precedent to some of the consumer, consumer behavior trends, um, followed by um, some F&B uh, trends that we're seeing within the region. When looking at the market spotlight on the Asian region, um, it's really pretty much about the growth of the middle class. In 2017, there were 3.3 billion middle class consumers uh, across the globe. And over the next five years, we're going to see a growth of 160 million middle class consumers annually um, in the world. And over 88% of the next billion entrants in the middle class will come from Asia. We have 350 million from China, 380 million from India, 210 million from the rest of Asia, compared to only 160 million middle class entrants coming from the rest of the globe. And in terms of consumer spending, um, we're looking at consumer spending in Asia Pacific in 2009 within the middle class was at $4.9 trillion. We're looking at that number going to $32.9 trillion in 2030. So you're talking about massive amounts of spending power within the middle class in the Asia Pacific region. So whether you're a purveyor of uh, consumer products, a restaurateur, in the hospitality business, or perhaps in the online commerce business, the sweet spot is all about the middle class. I remember a few years ago, I spoke about the proliferation of low-cost airlines and AirAsia's Now Everybody Can Fly proposition that brought accessibility to travel for Asian, the Asian middle class, or the growth of brands, fast fashion brands such as Zara and H&M, who filled the, fulfilled the promise of bringing fashion products from concept onto store shelves within less than four weeks. Fast forward to 2018, we're now slowly witnessing the slow demise of retail. As H&M reported in January, they had $4.3 billion of unsold inventory in their books and profitability was down by 14%. Zara also reported at the end of February that their stock price was down um, the, at the lowest point in three years. At the same time, we're seeing the growth of affordable luxury brands targeting the upper middle class, a, uh, a growing, uh, a market's uh, a consumer segment with enormous purchasing power, brands like Citizen M, or online e-tailers like Boohoo.com out of the UK, which recently reported a 97% increase in profitability um, in fiscal 2017. Or perhaps the rise of disruptions challenging old business models, such as Deliveroo, which received $385 million of funding um, at the end of 2016, giving it a market valuation of $2 billion and now operating in over 150 countries across the globe. Or perhaps companies like Salt, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform based on the blockchain technology, which is currently cha challenging the traditional banking lending platforms. And all the co although the conversation about Asia is predominantly centered around China and India. Asia's potential lies far beyond these two countries in the region of Southeast Asia, which is geograf geographically expansive and tremendously diverse. With a population of 620 million people in 2017 and a GDP of $2.6 trillion, Southeast Asia will become the world's fifth largest economy by 2020. And as we're seeing geopolitical activity in the South China Sea, um, it's bringing about both socioeconomic and political, uh, greater political influence into the region by China, the United States, and Japan. As mentioned yesterday by Kun Titinan, China is connecting its mainland cities to ports within Southeast Asia and Asian cities through China Rail as one of their one belt, one road uh, um, project, and they're doing this in the, so that their trade routes can still be maintained in the event of an impending conflict in the South China Sea. At the same time, 
Japan is trying to match up, it's the, the, uh, trying to balance the Chinese influence in the region by investing in infrastructure projects into Southeast Asia as well. And perhaps you didn't know, between 2004 and 2015, the United States FDI in the ASEAN region was at $274 billion, which was higher than the investment they made in Australia, India, China, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. And looking at the growth in South, Southeast Asia, one of the biggest segments is really the internet economy, which in 2017 was at $50 billion and is expected to grow to $200 billion in 2025. And that's been fueled by seven internet unicorns whose market valuations are over $1 billion. And this includes Grab and Gojek in the ride-hailing categories, Traveloka in the travel category, Tokopedia, C, and Lazada in the online commerce segments, and Razor in the online gaming segment. The Asian region will also be one of the most coveted areas for food service operators and investors. The Asia Pacific region, led by China, today is already, already the largest restaurant market um, in the world. And the chain restaurant component of the Asian Pacific market is expected to grow by 34.3% to, to, to $283 billion annually between 2014 and 2019. We're also seeing significant private equity investments globally in food and beverage as, as well as within the region. Private equity is having a love affair with food and beverage companies and we're seeing valuations of F&B companies at almost 10 to 12x EBITDA. El Catatan, which is the private equity arm of LV LVMH with $12 billion in assets, one of the largest consumer-led private equity firms, has invested in a number of uh, F&B groups, including their $90 million acquisition in 2014 of the Chinese restaurant brand Crystal Jade, um, their investment in the uh, beach club uh, brand, uh, nightclub brand C'est La Vie, Jones the Grocer, and most recently this year, they made a $15 million investment in the Impresario Group in India to fund the group's uh, expansion in subcontinent India. Dream, a company that you surely would be aware of, has 170 outlets, including brands such as Zuma, Roka, Koya, and Peyote, and also the famous Turkish steakhouse brand Nusrat, recently announced an investment by the Singapore Investment Authority, GIC, and Tamasek of $200 million, giving it a market valuation of $1.2 billion. These are valuations we're seeing in F&B that, that, are, that are unprecedented. Closer to, the shore, closer to our shores, in Thailand itself, a very popular dessert brand known as After You, listed in Thailand at the beginning of 2017, and today its stock price trades at 80 times earnings. The economic progression within Asia and Asia Pacific in the last two decades has had a significant impact on consumer behavior evolutions within the region, which are moving at such rapid speeds, it's forcing companies to, be, to stay nimble in order, uh, at the risk of obsolescence. Back in the day, growing up in Thailand, I remember when there was a lag between uh, consumer behavior in the East and the West. But Fast forward to 2018, as music, movies, and consumer products are released to the market at the same time, we're almost seeing very little um, lag between cons in consumer behavior ideology between the East and the West. The only difference that we're seeing is that the progression and the evolution of consumer behavior within this region has happened in such a short span of time. We're also seeing the emergence of um, new demographics and sub-demographics within the region, and we're seeing new products and services catering specifically to these sub-demographics. So what's actually happening is we're moving from marketing to, in, to, to groups, to larger groups of consumers, to marketing to the individual needs and personalized needs of the consumer. Um, and we're seeing the proliferation of a lot of new brands. If we look at the hospitality industry as an example, 20 years ago there was only a, a few very large brands, but today we're seeing new brands proliferating in the hospitality space, 
and uh, each of these brands are targeting individual segments within, within, within the uh, consumer uh, demographic. And uh, what, what's, what threat, what's scary for me is that we're also seeing a, a lot of consolidation in the hospitality industry as we uh, witnessed recently with uh, Accor's acquisition of Movenpick, which are making these hospitality companies so much bigger, but at the time, at, at the same time, while they're becoming bigger, they need to start thinking small. Um, a Titanic in the making, perhaps? Food for thought. We've been hearing over the last two days, everybody's kind of talking about the Asian millennial, and a lot of us are realizing that we're, we're, we're not millennials anymore, and why, why aren't our demographics, uh, why, are our, why are other demographics being alienated? And why are Asian millennials such a high, highly influential demographic? And why are products and services, why are they the precedent for the introduction of products and services into the market? And the primary reason for that is because the millennials represent more than 45% of the region's population, with 60% of the world's millennials expected to be in Asia by 2020. Also, in terms of the millennial spending power, we're looking at the millennial, millennial disposable income in 2020 within the Asian region alone. We're looking at $6 trillion. So marketers see it as an opportunity to tap into the millennial market now. And because they're still very young, they can perhaps gain their loyalty now and continue to benefit from them going forward. So let's explore some of these um, millennial consumer behavior trends in 2018 that perhaps will have an effect on your business going forward. So the millennial is really pretty much about the mobile first, whether it's communications, watching movies, listening to music, playing games, or purchasing goods and services, it's all pretty much being done by, on the mobile phone. And smartphone penetration by millennials is almost some of the highest in the world at about 90%. And within Asia, um, the, the amount of hours spent per day is also highest in the world. Um, the Asian millennial is spending almost 3.6 hours a day um, on their mobile internet, which is much higher than the United States, which is at two hours per day, or the UK, which is at 1.8 hours a day. The, the highest penetration in the world, I'm sure you guys have guessed this, is in Thailand. Thailand internet penetration on mobile is at 4.2 hours a day, and I attribute this to traffic congestion and people finding themselves uh, on the road for most of the day as they commute back and forth from work. Southeast Asia also has some of the highest growth rates in terms of internet users. There were 330 million internet users at the end of 2017. That's growing to 480 million in 2020 and growing at a rate of 3.8 million um, new internet users per month. The Asian millennial is really no longer interested in sharing their moments using static images or texts. It's really pretty much all about video. And 80% of the global internet traffic will be based on video by 2019. YouTube is also recording five billion video views per day with some of the highest viewerships in countries like Japan, Vietnam, and Thailand. These are the top countries in, within Asia that are in the top 10 in the world. And we're also seeing, Asia also witnessed um, the increase in viewer watch times tripled um, over the last three years. Mark Zuckerberg also reported in, at the end of 2017 that Instagram stories had now reached 300 million daily active viewers, which surpassed Snapchat once they implemented the augmented reality face feature. So as providers of goods and services, if you want to communicate to these millennials, it's pretty much all about video content. The Asian millennial is also very anxious about their future. They're not only anxious about their personal and work life, but they're also anxious because they've come into the t coming to the world at a time where there's a lot of anxiety about what's happening. There's climate change issues. There's um, environmental degradation. There's rise of discrimination and racism. 
Um, there's a political problems, right-wing movements. There's a lot of these types of issues occurring in their lives which they had nothing to do with, but they've just been born at the wrong time, perhaps. And there's a, so there's a lot of anxiety in terms of what's happening in the future. And what that's doing, it's becoming a cap catalyst for social and political movements and what we call social media activism, where, where these millennials are seeing things that they don't like. And this is per really fantastic for regions like Asia, where we have graft, corruption, uh, Governments not taking care of the environment and the consumers are using social media as, be, as, as a voice to make the governments react on some of these things. And we've seen this in Thailand. If you saw the uh, poaching case with one of our big executives, this case would have never been prosecuted had it not been for the millennials coming out there and activating and, and, and making sure their voice was heard. One of the other things we're also seeing is that millennials are coming into um, the world at a time in which the disparity between the wages that they're making and the price of assets and goods and services, there's such a great uh, disparity that they don't think they're going to be able to acquire wealth or accumulate assets anytime within the next two or three decades. So the solution to that is to invest in cryptocurrency. And if you sit around with millennials today, many of them are very much knowledgeable about cryptocurrency and many of them are making investments by, by talking to their friends and asking them for their, their advice and and hoping that that'll help them to bridge the economic uh, gap. So what's actually happening is the millennium, millennial actually knows that a lot of these advertisers want to reach them. They're also seeing a lot of content come to them in terms of advertising material. And the there's a paradigm shift that is happening. The, the Asian millennial has now a very le low level of tolerance for overly commercial content, and he's also able to spot somebody who's overselling him or trying to push overly commercial content from a mile away. And this paradigm shift is that the, the millennial is no longer just wanting to engage with brands that are cool. There was a little a research done um, a couple months ago, where they, where they asked millennials what they, what they wanted to see from the brands that they engaged with. And these were some of the things that they said. They said that responsiveness was great because most of them are engaging in, in, on social media with these brands. So responsive was really an important aspect. Honesty and sincerity was really important. They also wanted to engage with brands that had a sense of purpose of what they did beyond just the, being in a transactional business. They also wanted to see educational content or behind the scenes information uh, or, or behind the scenes um, um, videos so that they could see what the company really stands for. And what the millennials are really looking for today is they're looking for more substance. They want to know what's real and genuine about the brand. They want to hear the CEO and the leaders speaking about what they believe in. And they want to engage with products and services that have a human impact. And this is, this is going to be very, very important for purveyors of products and services going forward because if you miscommunicate, if you have the wrong type of messaging or you have the wrong type of voice or personality in the way that you communicate to these millennials, you will lose them and you'll never be able to get them back because they are that fickle. And Go, moving into F and B trends, about 12 months ago, I spoke about um, sorry, um, I spoke about um, sustainability and the uh, movement toward health consciousness. And I said that you know, countries like Thailand and Southeast Asia, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. Come 12 months later, it is the millennial consumer that is really pushing the hotel industry as well as the, uh, 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 well the F&B industry to act now. As I said, they're anxious about the future. They see the environmental degradation that's happened before their time, and they want operators and, and, and restaurateurs to start acting now. And we're starting to see um, a lot of innovation happening in the region in terms of sustainability in initiatives. Licky Blue, a fintech company from Switzerland, which has developed a global, global marketplace based on the blockchain technology, recently released a, a tree coin, 
a cryptocurrency that allows corporations to offset their carbon footprint by investing in natural capital. By acquiring a single tree coin, a single tree coin acquisition plants a mangrove in the Thor Heyerdahl Climate Park in Myanmar, um, managed by World View International, a leader in uh, mangrove restoration. And we're seeing, and they're collaborating with all sorts of companies in various industries. And last year, Wonderfruit, which is a very popular um, uh, music and entertainment festival, partnered with Licky Blue. And what they did was for all the consumer uh, expenses and purchases that were made during uh, the Wonderfruit Festival, the festival allowed the consumers to accrue tree coins as part of their purchases. And we're seeing a lot of this type of activity happen in terms of sustainability, which allows corporations to actually invest in natural capital. We're also seeing um, the rise of organic farms across the region, as well as, as farm-to-table concepts proliferating, proliferating in Asia. And these are concepts that are here to stay. One of the things that is very positive for the industry, especially in Southeast Asia, is really what I call the rise of, of entrepreneurship within the region and the hipster disruption. Entrepreneurs with very little experience in the hospital and in the F and B space are getting together, putting concepts together, getting the required capital um, to invest in a restaurant outlet, and they're pretty much take. A, a, um, not looking at any of the best practices or preconceived notions that we've learned um, we had to implement when putting a restaurant together. And some of these restaurants have become some of the most successful outlets within the region. Restaurants like El Mercado, which has, I would say, a D or F location, but today, and they didn't use any interior designers or uh, lighting designers, but the consumer, the hipsters love it, and they're doing exceptionally well. Or brands like La Favela in Bali, which probably does over um, one to 2,000 visitors. This is in Seminyak, Bali, and the guy built the place entirely out of scrap. Or perhaps, um, not giving myself lip service, Soho Hospitality's Havana Social, which is also in a D or F, I would say, let's say D location, although we did use an interior, uh, our own interior design team and a lighting designer to put this together, we scoured the local um, vintage markets for furniture, and it's by far the lowest rent we paid and the, 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 the highest return on investment we've made out of all of our five restaurants. So this hipster disruption is here to say, and, we're, and, we're, and I think it's good for the industry and it's um, good for consumers in the end. As we saw earlier today, International tourists are traveling to eat with a Michelin guide coming to Singapore and now in Thailand in 2017, as well as many restaurants um, receiving uh, recognition and rankings from Asia in the world's 50 best. International tourists are now opting to pre-book their, uh, their dining um, destinations as part of their travel plans. And besides booking uh, uh, aggregators and reservation engines such as Chope and uh, uh, TripAdvisor. We're now seeing uh, Airbnb, Expedia, Booking.com trying to integrate some of these dining experience within th their overall uh, tr uh, travelers um, uh, tr with, with, uh, and integrate them with the travel plans um, of their consumers. And we believe that there will be more aggregators Go, uh, coming to the market going forward, perhaps there will be a book, uh, booking.com or a uh, agoda.com for specifically for the um, uh, food and beverage industry. We're also seeing a growth of the food delivery market. This is actually a, um, a uh, map of all the merger and acquisitions that have occurred within the uh, food delivery space. 
And uh, although many of these markets have already reached their maturity, there's enormous amounts of consolidation activity happening. And the market for food delivery today stands at about $83 billion. And although it seems like it's reached its maturity, it's only 1%. That's only 1% of the overall market for, uh, for uh, in terms of the food industry, and 4% in, the, in terms of the market for uh, chain and uh, restaurants across the globe. And in countries, uh, cities such as Bangkok, Jakarta, Bombay, Delhi, where there's enormous amounts of uh, traffic congestions and consumers are spending a lot of time on the road um, getting to and, and from work, many consumers, including millennials, are opting to dine in and use some of these food delivery uh, platforms to bring the food to them as opposed to going out to restaurants. Personally, I'm not really sure whether the food delivery uh, industry is a friend of a, or a foe. I, I went through a lot of pain to negotiate you know, a 25% commission with some of these food delivery providers. And what scares me is I don't really even know what they're doing with the food when it leaves um, my restaurant and, and, and before it gets to my consumer. The other thing that really scares me about the food delivery industry is they have a lot of uh, data analytics on what's being sold within each district. And they're now using that data to partner with restaurants to offer, um, to build kitchens and offer food within those particular districts as part of a collaborative effort. So it's also the, blur the lines are getting blurred, whether they're in the delivery business or actually in the restaurant business. So I'm, as, as a restaurateur, I'm not really sure if these guys are a friend or a foe. I really believe that the future restaurants groups will be technology-driven companies. Um, data analytics is becoming very, very important in terms of allowing us to make real-time decision-making. The problem in the industry today is we've got too many different disparate systems that are not talking to each other. So although we have access to this data, it's really of no value to us if we can't really use it. There are some companies out there who are developing um, data analytics tools with KPIs in them. And once um, these KPI thresholds are, 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 are passed, we're, they're able to send email alerts to the respective people responsible for those, uh, for those metrics within the organization, some of which we're currently using at Soho Hospitality. But I do believe that there's a lot more innovation um, in this space where we can have connectivity all the way from reservation um, management, table management, point of sales, as well as customer relationship management and managing the interaction and of our consumers on social media and then tying that data back into our system. So I believe that there, there is an opportunity for disruption within the tech space and food, um, but um, it's something that uh, remains to be seen. And perhaps I'll be talking to you about this uh, sometime uh, next year. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Um, I think that going forward, um, the evolution of consumer behavior within this region continues to evolve and move at such rapid speeds. And I think that the, that evolution, the speed at which it's occurring, really threatens the, all of our businesses. And I think that each and every one of us within our organizations, whether large or small, we need to invest in resources who will help to look at some of these evolutions and study them and see how they affect our business, as well as look at how we can invest in innovation um, as a group and as, a, 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 as an industry. One of the topics that really uh, is close to my heart is the issue of uh, sustainability. And I really believe that each one of us in the hospitality and the restaurant industry has to do our part to protect the Earth's vital assets. In 2018, Soho Hospitality will be announcing the Greenhouse Project, a sustainable initiative designed to eliminate single plastic use at all of our restaurants, along with other initiatives as well. And we're working on building a platform with some, le some, leader some leaders in the sustainable world so that we can gather this data, use it, practice it, as well as share it with our peers. 
And this year we were also have partnered with Licky Blue and we've pledged to um, purchase 15,000 mangrove trees in the Thor Heyerdahl Climate Park in Myanmar, which will make our company uh, a carbon footprint positive. And if any of you are interested in joining us in some of these initiatives, I'll be happy to share some of the information that we've learned. Thank you so much. Questions? Thank you, Rohit. I, I really share your passion. Um, can we move back to the money part, though? So let's say you had $100 million uh, in, your, in your fund. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about technology, you talked about brand, you talked about all those middle market consumers. Mm -hmm. Food business, at the end of the day, is about achieving scale and consistency. 100%. So in the ASEAN region, if you want to use your own brands, these, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. uh, restaurants that you have that have really come together well, but now it's time to get some traction. So mm -hmm. how would you use your $100 million and how quickly would you spend it and in which markets would you spend it? Great question because yeah. that's exactly, I don't have the $100 million, but that's, that's exactly where we are, trying to look at um, um, scalability issues within our uh, organization. Um, Personally, I, I would leverage the existing brands that we have and the newer ones that we're introducing in the market because they are successfully proven brands. And um, there are several markets that I, I think are, are very promising. Um, markets like J Bali, um, Jakarta, Manila, KL, markets where the barriers to entry are not as significant in terms of the, cap the capex required. Uh, we do feel like we would like to um, enter markets like Singapore or Hong Kong, but they're very a lot more challenging in terms of the initial investment required as well as um, you know acquisition of of, of potential sites. Um, but I, I look at I look at some of the, some of those regions, and I and we're moving away. Um, initially, we were looking at franchising um, our outlets, and and we'll continue to do that outside of our core markets, but within the core markets where we feel that there's, there's uh, potential for scalability, we're actually looking at owning and operating, going within those countries and owning a, and operating our brands. Anyone else? So I think we talked about this briefly yesterday, <clears throat> but if you look at the entire delivery app sort of space, right, and obviously you're quite impacted by it, um, and you will be, and continue to be, and their model is sort of fluid. But one of the things they don't have is they don't have profitability, right? And it's very questionable, therefore, what is the ultimate game that this is gonna end up with. So they make, they make a disproportionate share of noise compared to what their business really is, right? Um, and attract a disproportionate share of funding, possibly even more funding than is actually going into the food business itself, right? What's your view on that, and where do you think it's gonna pan out? And do you think there's a counterplay, or do you, I mean, do you think at some point they're gonna take a great, greater share of your profits, a little bit like the OTAs are taking a greater share of hotel profits. Yeah, I mean, they are taking, they are like, they, it does feel like the OTA. Um, the only difference is that they're never going to replace um, the whole um, experience of a consumer coming and dining at our outlets. So that, we do have some, um, you know, we are protected to a, to, a, to a certain degree. And I think the truth is um, the consolidation that's happening in the market is primarily because a lot of these companies are not making money. Um, but um, one way, I think we're going to see more consolidation activity happen in the market. I think the big players are going to are going to get bigger. The guys like Deliveroo, as, as I mentioned, operating in 150 countries today, $2 billion in valuation. Um, but perhaps they need to become a logistics business as opposed to a just a food delivery business, almost like how Uber went from, um, well, Uber's a bad example because they just got out of this region, primarily because they want to list the company and they needed to clean up their books. That was really the primary reason that they got out of the region. But you know, perhaps they need to look at becoming a logistics company and looking at other things that they can deliver um, and bring to the doorsteps of consumers beyond, beyond food. Um, I don't really have insight into, you know, what these books look like, but, but it's true. This consolidation activity is occurring primarily because a lot of these businesses um, don't have profitability. But that, isn't that the American model, like build up revenue and market share and worry about 
profits later. Amazon did that for, for many years. And uh, perhaps that's, that's what they're looking to, to do because there's so many competitors out there that are looking to grab market share first and then look at how to make money. Well, if that's any more questions? No? Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity.